I actually don't know why it's not projecting. It was up a second ago. I think the cable is maybe not getting the same. Flicker glass cable.
I don't, uh, when I see you smiling like that, Boyan, I'm worried because. Oh, yeah. He, uh, he deep faked me in his final project last term, so I'm a little, I'm a little wary. Okay, welcome back everybody. <clears throat> Let's get started. We have a double recording technology going here. So I'm mic'd like six times and I've got, I'm plugged in over here and uh, hopefully one of the two of them is gonna look great. <laughs> uh, thank you to the TAs who are working hard to make this good. Okay, so I wanna pick up where we left off. We did a lot of stuff last week, uh, yeah, and, <clears throat> um, but we didn't complete the story, right? We had this basic idea that I'm gonna put a red brick in front of you, we're gonna design a complete stack to go pick up the brick, move it to the next, uh, you know, from one bin to the next. And I, today I wanna complete that story for you, right? So this was our task, basically red brick, EWA with a WSG gripper, uh, we're just gonna pick it up move it to the other side. And if you remember, the sketch for how we were gonna do that had a few steps. The first step, we had to learn a bit about kinematic frames, how to work with them, the spatial algebra of reasoning about uh, frames, rotations, and translations. Then we um, made a sketch in the end effector coordinates. So we decided that Okay, if I know the initial pose, given a particular, you know, in the world frame, for instance, of the, of the object, then I can figure out what I want my gripper frame to be relative to the object frame. I can project that into world coordinates, and I can go through and make a bunch of key frames for where I'd like that gripper to eventually go. And then I can connect those key frames with a trajectory. We talked a little bit about how to interpolate carefully on the trajectory. But the last big step is to turn that end effector trajectory now into joint trajectories, because that's what we have to send to the robot. And we started that too. We started talking about the forward kinematics, right? If you have the joint angles of the robot, how would you figure out what's the pose of the end effector? That's the forward kinematics problems. And at the very end, I mentioned uh, that we're gonna try to use differential kinematics to solve, to decide our joint angles. And so today we're gonna try to finish that story. And I loved the questions I got last time. Uh, please keep them coming. Uh, I'm prepared to speed up or slow down depending on, on what you guys need and want. So let's just make sure when I write this down that we're super clear. I, I remember I, one time in answering one of those questions I said positions and I'm like, well, no, but, the other positions, right? I just wanna be super clear that the, we, we do use the word position to mean a three element vector in space. We also use it to mean the notion of generalized positions is the Q that we talk about, which is the, you know, in the Iwa case is just a series of joint angles, but more generally it's whatever coordinate system we need as a sufficient description of the complete configuration of the robot and the object, it's a, you know, everything in the multi-body plant, okay? So generalized positions, we call Q. So when you say plant.getPositions or set positions, it's talking about this generalized positions. And then this is the pose, right? We talked about the, the representing that as a transform or a pose. And uh, this is of the body or frame B, B typically meaning the body. Right, and this without the extra superlatives would means it's in world, in the world frame, expressed in the world frame and relative to the world frame. Good, so, so that's the, we sort of figured out how to do that, that we, we could go through a series of our spatial algebra re relations and go from end effector to the second to last end effector to all the way up to the base and figure out the transform from the gripper to in the world. The, the thing we, um, you know, that you guys asked a bunch about that I, I hadn't, I tried to sweep under the rug, 
uh, was this, uh, this notion of different representations for 3D rotation. I still want to mostly sweep it, sweep it under the rug. Uh, posted on Piazza uh, earlier too, but, but I did try to write some more notes about that just so you have references. And I'll just say a, a bit about it now because it actually will play out in the differential kinematics story too. And it's important to think about, um, you know, just to understand that there are different rotation representations and all of the, comp all of the complexity of what we're going to talk about today is sort of comes down to this, I would say. So the fundamental problem is, so in, in 2D space, having a, an angle is enough to tell me what a rotation is, right? If, I, if, I wanna, if, I'm, in, if I'm in the plane and I want to just rotate a, a, a vector, I can do that with just an angle. In 3D, you would think that you'd use three angles to do that, and you can, but there's a problem. If you only use three numbers, like the roll, pitch, and yaw would be the, the, a standard thing, then you can run into singularities, basically because roll, pitch, and yaw all live on, uh, you know, on the, the sphere, you know, on, the, on a circle, and when each of them are pi in the wrong place, you can end up with a singularity. And there's, it's well understood that there, you cannot completely, without singularities, represent rotations in 3D with just three numbers. You need one more number. And because of that, there's a handful of different choices of, of which, which numbers you might do. Um, <clears throat> so the ones that I, I called out here, you can use three by three rotation matrices. Right, which have the property that you can think of this as the x axis, the y axis, and the z axis unit vectors stacked up, and that's a total of nine numbers. Way more than three, right? But great on a GPU, or great on a, on a processor. And it, this is a, you can often do a lot of computations nicely with the rotation matrix. <clears throat> the more minimal representation you would think would be the Euler angles. In particular, the one we use in Drake is roll, pitch, yaw. Okay, so roll is a rotation around x, the x-axis. Pitch is a rotation around the y-axis. Yaw is a rotation around the z-axis. Okay. This is three numbers. It's convenient to think about. I can, I can sort of intu intuit roll, pitch, and yaw. But it has a singular. But it has singularities. Okay, so we use roll, pitch, and yaw a lot when the human's involved. Like if you're in a, a, a description file and you want to just position something, it's often easier to type in roll, pitch, and yaw. Like a, the universal robot description format, the scene description format, all the standard formats will take in a roll, pitch, yaw description of the orientation. And that's fine if you are specifying it in one direction, but it has singularities. There are a few more that you might know or might have heard of. The axis angle representation, where you can specify any rotation in 3D by a vector and a, rot and a scalar rotation around that vector. That vector may not be axis aligned, almost certainly isn't for interesting rotations but you can always pick a vector and then think about a scalar rotation around that vector. And that's four numbers again, but a complete description that's useful for some things. I used it for interpolating between two rotations last time. And then there's the um, famous unit quaternions. Again, four numbers. And you can actually think of unit quaternions a lot like the axis angles, if you want geometric interpretations of it. A scalar, you know, cleverly scaled to be on the unit circle in four dimensions. Um, they do have an interpretation like that. Okay, and there's a lot of, a lot of things to know about quaternions. So I just want, I want you to be familiar, I want you to sort of recognize these, but the most important thing, like I said last time, is knowing that 
Um, they all exist. You can go back and forth between them, you know, except for the, in a few cases of singularities, you can go perfectly back and forth between them, okay? And they're good for different computations, right? So having a unit quaternion just four numbers is, for instance, the choice we make when we're, we're populating our, our configuration in a vector Q. So the generalized positions we choose when we want to represent a, an orientation is we use the unit quaternion. But when we're doing kinematics queries, we often use the three by three rotation matrices, for instance. Does that make sense? Questions about that? Yeah. Yeah, so um, the, it's famously known as gimbal lock, okay? So uh, basically, if you rotate pi this way and pi this way, then you can't come out. There's, there's, a, there's a singularity in trying to understand uh, what's gonna happen. I mean, there's even, you can't rotate. There's directions where it's like you can't rotate. There's a singularity in this map. Um, it, it always happens. You can, you can try to place it. You can choose your coordinate system so that it's sort of the singularity is in a reasonable place. But um, it always happens at this sort of like pi pi case. Yes? Yeah, it's just a it's just a limitation of the three of using only three numbers to represent this topological space. There's um, you actually, you know, this space wants to live in four dimensions. So trying to you know I, we're going to give a really good example of the singularities in a in a few minutes. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a well known sort of it's, it's frustrating but but well known that you can't do it. So <clears throat> just to make that super. Clear, right? So if you think of a single free body, so I took in pseudocode here, I took a plant, I just added the brick, only the brick, that's it. It's not welded, it's just floating around, right? So it's a free body, right? And, and I've got a context for it. I didn't mean for that to be there already, but what is Q, right? If I, if I say plant.getPositions, what is Q in this case? Positions and orientations, how big is it? It's in seven, which is a coincidence that Iwa has seven, right? But, it, but this is three positions and then four numbers in a quaternion stacked in a vector to make up the, ve the vector Q. What is the pose? If I were to call plant evaluate body pose in world, right? What is that thing? We, so the output of this is a rigid transform. The representation it uses on, you know, in memory is actually the rotation matrix plus the translation matrix, plus, plus three, three numbers plus the three by three rotation. Right? So it's a three by four matrix. Okay, so when you go from, in this case where the Q vector perfectly represents the position of the object. That's all, it's only job in, Q, in, this, in this setting, right? I've got a single free body. The only job of Q is to tell me where the body is in the world. And I'm asking the question of the kinematics engine, where is the body in the world? It's kind of funny, but this kinematics function, which in the robot case does lots of work, what it's doing here is really just changing coordinates from quaternions to rotation matrices. Right? It's still doing some work, but it's just doing the, the change of, of representation. Is that clear? Because we're going to take derivatives of this in a second. So you want to make sure it's clear. Yeah. Oh, sorry. So you were saying it's like in the case of an identity transform, it's still doing work, is that what you're saying? Or is it not? Let me say it carefully. So it's, you might think it's the identity transform. The same information is present here and here but it is more than, the, it is not just an identity transform because the way that the orientations are represented in the Q vector are different than the three by three matrix. It has to convert from quaternions into rotation matrices in this transformation. This function as I've written it is doing, is not the identity matrix okay, or the identity. Like the, 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 
if you were to put XB on the object? Tell me what you mean. Yeah. This is just both of these contain the information, which is where is the is that object in the world? Yeah, yeah. No, it's good. I, I, I appreciate the questions. Okay, so we're going to take different uh, you know gradients of this thing now, right? And it was good. There was good questions about when when is the inverse kinematics well defined? When are there when are there many solutions? So we're going to get into that in some detail here, but we're going to see it through the lens first of differential kinematics. So if I have this function, which in the case of the Iwa, Q is a bunch of joint angles, not quaternions, right? But if I had a, a, the Iwa and a red brick, I might have the seven joints from Iwa and the seven numbers for the quaternion plus position of the brick, okay? Now if I ask a question, given those, those configuration Q, what is the position of some body, right? That's my function there. What I want to think about is what is the gradient of that function, right? So I want to say if I make a small change in my Q, what is a small change in the, what does it look like as a small change in the, in the pose, okay? And that's just a partial derivative of that function, okay? So the kinematics function, partial derivative, and it's, I mean, I think partial derivatives are basically always called Jacobians, but in robotics, you know, we, we don't even say kinematic Jacobian. We just say kinematic, or we just say Jacobian, and that's, everybody knows we're talking about this particular Jacobian, if there's no other context, right? Okay, so we're gonna try to study this object today, understand when it's full rank, when, it's, uh, when it loses rank, think about how to work with it as a, to make a controller. Okay, so, um, I just did this as a, you know, as, a, as a sort of variation here on Q, but if I were to take DT, if I were to take a Q dot here, DDT of Q, I can get DDT on this side, right? The, the derivative of this pose, DDT, is the spatial velocity, right? So the, the change in pose over time. And it's interesting to ask, this was a, we decided was a three by four matrix. That's how we choose to represent it in, for computations. What's the what right way to represent a spatial velocity, the derivatives? It turns out we're gonna think of it as a three element angular velocity and a three element translational velocity. So not the full 12 numbers. We're back down to six numbers. And the first point I wanna make sure I land for you is why that is. At least to some extent I want to land that. But there's a lot of Vs flying around here. Okay, so let me just you know, note the typesetting, okay? So there was the LaTeX you know, times Roman V, which is my generalized velocities. This V is translational velocities. There's a lot of velocities, and they're all V, right? And this is the spatial velocity, the capital. I'm trying to be super careful about that notation. It's almost always clear from the context. Like, sorry, not, not the context, but the, you know, from, from when you're reading, right, it should almost always be clear. It's very rare that we have them all in one equation. But nevertheless, I try to be really clear with that notation. Okay, so now the big question is 3D rotations were this weird thing that we needed a bunch of different possible options to represent. How do you represent angular velocity? It's derivative of rotational orientation, right? It turns out everything's good again. Three numbers are sufficient, right? Why, the fundamental reason why that is, so all the problems of the single, the, the, with the coordinates is because when you wrap around a two pi, you wanna get the same number again. There's the top, topology of that space wraps around on two pi in each, in each of the different coordinates. Angular velocities don't have to wrap, right? You can have an angular velocity greater than two pi. There's no, there's nothing, you can have an angular velocity of a, of a million in some direction, right? There's no, you know, getting bigger, big, getting bigger, and then I came back around. The, the space is easier when you're in angular velocities. And so it turns out that three numbers are sufficient. You could pick a various, you could pick various 
versions of three numbers. You could pick the derivatives of rule fit jaw if you wanted to. But the canonical one that has really nice properties for our spatial algebra is this angular velocity vector, which means something in, per in particular. It's, it's basically the, the L, it's a three element vector, right? There's, it's three numbers. So we call them wx, wy, wz, okay? And if you think about the direction of those three numbers, is kind of the instantaneous axis of, of rotation, and the magnitude of those three numbers is the rate of, or of rotation. You may never need to know that, uh, but, you, but you, what's important to know is that three numbers are all you need, and you don't. And we're gonna, they are sufficient and efficient in all of our computations, so we don't have a bunch of them flying around. We just always use this one. Okay. Is the last one made of the same beam? Yes, it is. Thank you. <laughs> that would be a lot more reasonable. Yeah. X, Y, Z. Yes. Thank you. Okay. They have the same sort of rules of algebra apply to spatial velocities. And I won't write them up slowly on the board, but basically they add. And you can use rotation matrices to change coordinates. All the same rules apply, okay? It's less common that you will have to manipulate the velocities. The dynamics engine is gonna do a lot of manipulating of those velocities for you. It's less common for you to have to, to, to know these rules. But I, I find myself going back and just saying, okay, you know, if I need them, then I can, I can, I can look here, <laughs> okay? And that's kind of the level I want you to have too. Okay, so let's just think this one through again. The, again, the simple case of a, of a free body, right? What is Q, what is V? Um, well, let's, let's do it carefully here. So Q, in the case of the single free body, we agreed was a seven element vector, three positions and four quaternions. If I say plant that get velocities, this is the generalized velocities, for the Iwa, it would be joint velocities, the rotations of each of those joints. But for the free body, right, it's this V, okay? What is V? How big is it? This time it's six elements, okay? So this is a six element vector, which is a little funny because that means the derivative of Q is not necessarily V, right? In some cases it is, but in general, there's some transformation that you have to use to go back and forth between V and Q dot. Okay, ask questions, is that clear? Yes. Yep, this is the generalized velocities. That's the translational velocity, and then the capital is spatial velocity. Yeah, no, that's great. Okay, this N is useful to know. It's, it, there's map Q dot to velocity, map velocity to Q dot. You can go back and forth between them. The transformation is a function of Q. So you pass in the context to get it. That's what, that's what's, this, is, this is like saying Q you know, times Q dot and, and vice versa. N is invertible, sorry. Okay. So now the question is, so we sort of understand, I think a little bit more maybe the, some of the subtleties of the representation. But when I write now, um, you know, the derivative of the forward kinematics, the output I get is always gonna be represented as a spatial velocity of a body, six numbers, right? I could take the derivative with respect to Q dot or with respect to V, you know, both of these are, are valid and both of those are real, available in the code, okay? But the Jacobian is gonna always output spatial velocity. All right, and so now let's step back and think about why, you know, how am I gonna use that in the code? Why is that the thing I want in order to move my robot? Okay, so we said this on the board last time. That's why I, I'm, you know, the stuff I'm putting on the slides is partly because people could see the slides better, but also 
Um, some of this we, we, is flushing out what we did last time. Okay, so there's the different kinematics problems we talked about. With the forward kinematics, which goes from joint positions, generalized positions, right, to pose. We talked about inverse kinematics, which goes from pose back to joint, joint positions. I put an asterisk there because I actually, when we, when we really cover inverse kinematics, I'm gonna to try to give you a much richer, I think, picture of inverse kinematics than just pose. You might wanna say, find me the closest pose, but you know, try to minimize something else and try to stay inside joint limits and whatever. There's a much richer way to specify inverse kinematics. But the vanilla inverse kinematics says, you've got an end effector, tell me what the joint positions are. And this is where, when you were asking last time about, you know, are there multiple solutions, this problem absolutely can have multiple solutions, right? You could say the same end effector, and there might be many joint angles that would get the same end, I'm trying to keep that still, same end effector, right? So that makes it a hard problem. It's also a very nonlinear problem in general. So it might be that um, some of my solvers, okay, if you have exactly six degrees of freedom in your robot, there's a, close, a serial chain robot, there's closed form solutions for this. And we know exactly what, where the solutions are. As soon as you have seven degrees of freedom, you have to do something more. And when you have a humanoid, you have to do, definitely have to do something more. And they, there's not, I mean, this is a, it's still a hard problem in some ways. Okay. How does differential kinematics fit in, right? Differential kinematics goes from joint positions and velocities to spatial velocity, right? The, it's, Jacobian had a function, of, it was a function of Q, and it multiplied the joint velocities to get to spatial velocity. Differential inverse kinematics is going the other way. It's gonna use the Jacobian again, something like the inverse of the Jacobian, to try to go the other way. So it's actually a function of spatial velocity and joint positions. I'll make this super clear, don't worry. But it's roughly it's going from spatial velocity to joint velocity. You know where you currently are, so the map from spatial velocity to joint velocity is a function of joint angles. In our notation, it looks like this. I basically am going from Q, you know, inverse kinematics goes from Q to pose, inverse kinematics roughly from pose back to Q. Differential kinematics is a configuration dependent map from, from, uh, from generalized velocities to spatial velocities. And inverse kinematics is trying to go from, it's a, again, configuration dependent map from spatial velocities back to velocity. Okay, my claim is inverse kinematics is hard. Differential inverse kinematics, it can still have multiple solutions and the like, but it's all easy because it's a linearization of the hard problem. And we're gonna be, have good solutions for it and be able to understand it completely. And it's, people use it on the robots all the time. Yes? Uh, when you talk about um, spatial velocity, that's the velocity of the end effect, right? That's the growth rate. Yep, exactly. It's any body or, um, so the most common one we'll use is the spatial velocity of the gripper frame. I'm glad you asked. It's not that. It's the little v. This is going from um, the generalized velocities. The generalized velocities may not be the deriv time derivative of the generalized positions, but they're related. So this is a non, not necessarily square matrix that transforms little v, not spatial v, to the time derivatives of, of the joint angles. I don't know how to say that better. Uh, but so, so this is a map, I mean, this is really, uh, in the case of joint angles, this is the identity map. It does no work. The only thing, the time it does work is when you have a different representation for the velocities than you do as the derivative of the positions. And that happens when you're doing these orientation things. So if you had a, 
quaternion in Q, then you don't use the time derivative of the quaternion, you use the angular velocity vector. So there's a, there's a change of variables that has to happen. Yeah, yeah, it's good, it's good. <laughs> I know when I've failed. <laughs> okay. All right, so we're gonna now, um, let me, before I put that up. Okay, so here's the straw man proposal for how we're gonna start moving the end effector, right? If I have And in the case, let's think of it this as the, a body, let's, even, let's use the gripper frame. I'll go ahead and, like you said, that's the most common frame we're gonna use is the gripper frame. So I'll make this gripper. Although I wrote everything in, if I write B later, that's my, that was a bad, this was a bad choice, but. Um, okay. So <clears throat> in this case, if I, let's forget the brick exists for a minute, let's just think about moving the EWA around, okay? So in that case, if it's just the EWA, then this is seven joint velocities because there happens to be seven degrees of freedom on that robot, okay? This is my six element spatial velocity. Now, <clears throat> what we had from last time was we had a bunch of grippers. We had gripper at time equals zero. We had gripper at time equals you know, pre-pick. Remember how we had the whole trajectory, right? We actually turned that into a, a function that was defined for all t in my interval. zero to t final, okay? I'll try to write bigger, but I'm hoping the video is better today. <clears throat> okay. And there was a, you know, there's software that helps you represent that, right? With piecewise polynomials, piecewise linear interpolation of the positions. You remember, and then we had to do that slurp for the quaternion, okay? But we had a nice representation of this that defined it for all t. You can take a derivative of that representation and it will give you another trajectory that's the time derivative of the, the, the velocity, the spatial velocity as a function of time. So my proposal is if I have a, if I had my plan and I basically tells me what my end effector, my gripper velocity should be at all times, spatial velocity, then can I use this to decide what my joint angles should be? Okay, and the proposal is something like, I want V of T to be the inverse of this. Right? This relationship is, is a nonlinear function of Q, but it's a linear function, a linear relationship between the, it's just the, I mean, gradients are always a linear relationship, right? But it's um, a linear relationship between the joint velocities and the spatial velocities. Since I know Q, this is just a matrix. And I can try to take its inverse to try to go the other way. So that tells me, you know, given I wanna go in some direction, what should my change in my joint angles be? Now, if I write this, the natural question is, can you take that inverse? Does that work? Okay. Can I take that inverse? <laughs> Does it work ever in this case?
What's the size of the matrix J? Six by seven, which is not square. So you shouldn't write, I shouldn't write that. Like I kind of don't want that on the board, but I, this, you know, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't take an inverse, I can't take an inverse of a non-square matrix, right? There are generalizations of the inverse that can work for non-square matrices and we'll definitely, we'll, we'll use them now, right? So J, G of Q is a six by seven matrix doesn't have an inverse, <clears throat> but the generalization is the pseudo-inverse. People, how many people know the pseudo-inverse? Okay. So everybody has their own favorite um, symbol for it, right? I wrote this before as a, you know, minus one as the inverse. People use like music symbols and whatever. I, I just use plus, okay? Plus is my pseudo inverse. Okay, and the question is now not does the inverse exist, but when does the, the pseudo inverse will always return something? The question is, is it any good? Okay. And we'll, we'll, we'll dig into exactly how you compute the pseudo inverse in a minute. But uh, first, just think, just know that there's, you could like call P in the MATLAB, right? You can, there's, it's a linear algebra operation or a numpy, you know, and you can ask for the pseudo inverse of, of a matrix like this. And the question is, um, when does it work, right? So in particular, I want, what, what do I want? I want, if I put a desired VB in, and I use the pseudo inverse here to get a joint velocity. If I were to put that back through, right, and think about what actually, what was the resulting VB actual, when does this equal this? Does that, does that make sense what I did? I went from, <clears throat> I went from end effector velocities into joint velocities with a qu questionable pseudo inverse. And then I went from, um, you know, joint velocities back to end effector. This one is always well defined. Okay. And the, the question is, when does that become the identity matrix? Right. When does this work? It can work even when it's a non-square matrix. It can give, in fact, this is the good case in some sense, right? Because we have being six by seven is the good case. We have six things we're trying to do and seven joints with which to try to do them, right? So you'd like to think, you'd like to be optimistic about this, that that, sh that transformation should work. People know when does that, do you know the property for that? Yeah, well, you, so full rank, which in this case would be at most the row rank, right? And the, the, the rank of the non-square matrix will be the, determined by the number, the, the smaller of the rows or columns, right? So works when JQ is full row rank. Here, rank J equals six. Now that's a math answer, which is a, the right answer. I mean, that's the question I asked. But uh, when you go to put it on the robot, there's a, you know, rank is like true or false, is the rank six. It's a true or false question. Okay, but if you, what really matters is somehow the condition of the matrix. If you get, um, if you look at the singular values of J and the smallest singular value gets very close to zero, then that means the matrix is getting numerically close to being non-invertible in this, in this sense. And you start having problems. Even if it's not, if it strictly has rank, but the condition is very bad, when the smallest singular value is small, close to zero, that means that I might, if I wanted to make small velocity, small movements in velocity here, it might take ridiculously large, uh, 
joint velocities to accomplish something small here if those eigenvalues, the singular values get very close to zero. Okay, so what we really want to look at is um, the smallest singular value. It should be, you know, not, when it gets close to zero is when you have, you have issues. Okay. So luckily for our IWA, you know, most of the time that's good. That this is, most of the time this is full row rank. And I did some little animations, which I are in the notebook, so you can run them. Uh, start with this Jacobian one here. Okay, so what I have here is an unfortunate choice of screen layout. I have here um, a little notebook that just prints the Jacobian when I move this thing around. Okay, so I can move this around and it's gonna print out the Jacobian, JG, the gripper Jacobian in a font that's probably not Useful, let me make it a little bigger here. Okay, and it also is just printing out the smallest singular value of that Jacobian, okay? And the game is, you know, move this around, convince yourself that in most um, configurations of this robot, it's, it's fine, it's pretty, really pretty good. How can I make it not good? Yeah, right, if I, if I put it, at the end of its, if I put it like straight out, right? Like if I straight it out, now I've got a smallest singular value of negative e to the negative 16. Okay, why is that? Right, the map saying I want to con command an instantaneous velocity in the end effector would require ridiculously large join angles. I mean, this is just, that's numerical nonsense, right? That's zero. Uh, that would, it's saying that, that I would need infinite velocity uh, at the joints to achieve some desired force at the end effector, right? If you tried to go straight down, it's not gonna work. It would require, if you wanted to move down at a certain velocity, it would, not requ it would require uh, you know, infinite joint velocities. That's a funny thing, right? Um, you should, ha maybe you should have a problem with that. Like, because um, that seems broken. It seems like maybe we've just written the problem down wrong, right? Because clearly the robot can move back down. How do I, how do I justify that? Like, are, are singularities real or is it just our math, my math's bad? The second derivative is non-zero. Okay, the second derivative is non-zero. So um, here's a super simple example to, to make that work out. Okay, so this is just a two-link robot. The, each link is the same length. So I can write the kinematics very simply. And I'm gonna just make it move through the straight position like this. Okay, so that's going through the singularity and back. I can loop it. I think I need to reflect it. That would be cool. Ah, oh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay, so do you understand what's happening here? Two, two link pendulum, they just happen to have exactly the same length that makes the kinematics trivial. It means I can write down the Jacobian, in, it's a two by two matrix, it's super simple. And that Jacobian loses rank when Qs are zero, like this, when it's straight out, okay? And I'm just playing, I'm just telling the robot to go through Q as a sine wave, basically. Q1 and Q2 are sine waves of equal, of scaled magnitude so that they, they stay perfectly in that line. Okay, it's clearly going out and coming back. It's not like it can't come back. So how does, what happens? Well, you know, we already got the, we got an answer, right? So at that instant of being completely out straight, 
it is true that the Jacobian is singular. Yeah? If I wanted to instantaneously command a velocity back here, I would fail. But I can accelerate back in that direction. Right? The derivative is OK. I can accelerate in that direction and get myself out of the singularity and, uh, and eventually get back and everything's good again. So it is absolutely true that the map that goes from vo joint velocities to end effector velocities has a problem. You cannot invert that map at this configuration. It does not mean your robot is stuck there for the rest of time, right? I mean, with some controllers, it is. OK, so we're not going to handle that case beautifully with the pseudo inverse controller. We're not going to try to. We'll handle it in a different way, OK? But in the case where we're close to full rank, we'd expect this sort of pseudo inverse to work well. The scary thing is when you get close to singularity, and then you start commanding very large velocities. Those are the kind of things that we, we definitely do want to address. Questions? You see one? Okay, there. Yes. Um, oh, so I'm sorry, down here. Okay, I, I'll get you next. I'm sorry. So this is for not being able to move with an algorithm. Can we capture not being able to move without our solution, outside of our solution? I see. So, so um, I think the question is you know, what math tells me that I can't go out, out there, right, beyond the reach of the robot? Uh, I mean, this, differentially, this is still telling me. Uh, also, if I command it in this, this direction, it will fail, right? And similarly, if I'm at the edge of some workspace and I'm trying to go, you know, it will, this is what happens actually, is you command yourself to go farther than you should, and your arm goes straight and the robot goes crazy. Um, so the math does tell you that in both directions. Uh, and I do, it's, a, it's a very much a differential quantity, so it's only telling you, as a function of this, which directions can I move. It's not an absolute workspace analysis. It's just different, it's just instantaneously, can I move in that direction? Sorry. Um, so if you're saying that like in that position you can't have like a discontinuous velocity, then is it that we tell like the robot part to have an acceleration and what would that mean? Great question. Yeah. So so if I was writing a really good controller and I found myself in this position, I would start commanding an acceleration and or or I could forget about trying to command an end effector. I could just command, like I, this controller is just, it makes a Q trajectory. It says, like, forget about the end effector for a minute. I'm just going to move the join angles through something, some simple function, right? But somehow in that situation, you have to give up on commanding via the velocity of the end effector. Great. Yes? I'm not able to distinguish my intuition between this motion, which is this side wave, and let's say we had the same end effector motion, but just going half the distance. So you, you go out there, and somehow that would be within the range of motion that would be controllable. But yeah. I mean, the motion is the same, so it just, I'm not able to picture why at any point here we can't have immediately a velocity and you can only accelerate. Great. So, so uh, I mean, I can't flip in that case, but let's say I was just going like this and, and back, right? So this is your example, right? But not going to full extension, right? That at any at any one of those configurations, if I wanted to command a particular x y position velocity, sorry, of the end effector, I could do so with a, a reasonable velocity in the joint angles, right? So that's that's the big difference. Is right in all of those configurations here. I still have the ability to command a velocity in the end effector. It's only when my Jacobian becomes close to singular that I, and when it's close to singular, it just requires ridiculously large velocities. And then when it's singular, there is no velocity. That's the, that's the critical difference, is that um, it's really because these things line up. And so think about the, the effect that moving this angle has on the end effector velocity. Right? It moves in both x and y here. But when I'm here, it only moves in y, if I had a multi-jointed elbow. Yeah? So the ability to command an x with respect to this is gone. And similarly, the, the ability to command in x, that, that direction, 
in this, in this joint angle is gone. And the, the rank of that matrix is what tells you that's true. Right? It's really just the, the trigon trigonometry of, of you know, what a small delta in that angle is going to produce at the end effector. So, yeah, sure. Yeah. It, uh, no, you could have it similarly if I were to, you guys, I need to do some yoga or something, but you know, if I were to go like this, right, you know, and if I folded back in onto myself, for instance, that could be on the inside of, it's still maybe, you could call it the edge of a configuration space workspace. Yeah, kind of feel like the, 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 the workspace is just shaped more like a ring. That's right. Edge. That's right. Yeah, okay, so is there ever an example? I think with, with more complicated mechanisms, you could say um, if you had like a four bar linkage or something, you could probably get yourself in trouble even in the comfort of your, the middle of your workspace. But it's certainly common that, that you would be, it, it's at the end of the workspace. Yes? Robots have broken for, because some people used simple Jacobian controllers and got too close to singularities, yeah. And in the you know, 80s in particular, there was a series of papers about what's the right way to do these sort of control that is, and they worried very much about not blowing up during the singularities. Absolutely, yeah. What physically happens? Yeah, so, so typically nowadays, the controller, that big box underneath the robot, says you've asked for a big velocity, and it, it, it turns off. If you made your own robot and you didn't put that safety protection in, then I did throw a robot across the room once. Um, yeah, that can happen, right? Uh, you know, and there's big red buttons next to the big robots um, in case that starts to happen. Yeah, but it can really, it can really, that math is bad. You shouldn't apply, you shouldn't apply that joint velocity command. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, I want to spend the rest of the lecture thinking about sort of maybe a generalized version of that pseudo inverse, a, a different view on that pseudo inverse, and it's going to at least help us think about um, putting some of the guardrails on so that it doesn't throw the robot across the room or, or fault the controller that's trying to keep you safe. And I'm going to do that by first just making us think about sort of the optimization view of what the pseudo inverse is doing. Okay, so I like optimization. That's, my, that's a thing. Um, and there's a lot of the, op, of the tools from class that will use the language of optimization. And really, you know, the code, the, the equations that are, uh, are giving us the pseudo inverse, I think are best understood as the solution to an optimization problem. And once we think about it that way, then it becomes natural to put on a few extra protections and so write a slightly different optimization problem that can say, you know, try to do that, but don't blow up, for instance, okay? So let's think about pseudo inverse as an optimization. What I want to say is it's, it's something, what I'm writing here is really something that looks kind of like this. Find me a, a joint velocities such that the end effector velocity is approximately equal to the desired spatial velocity. Right? I wrote it by taking that in, the pseudo inverse is sort of the solution to try to, to do that, but think about it in its sort of primal form. I'm trying to solve for a V such that this map comes close to my desired. Given, since Q is given in this case, we know where our robot is at any moment in time. So really this just looks like I could I could, I could write this, if I abstract away from the robot a little bit, this is just like saying find me an x such that ax is approximately equal to b. Right, if I just, 
This is just a six vector. I'll, I'll call it V this time. And this is this Jacobian. That's just, you know, in the language of linear algebra, this is really just AX equals V. And you can call slash and MATLAB to, to solve it. That's one of the ways to call a pseudo inverse, for instance, right? Now, <clears throat> a way to write this as an optimization is instead to say, um, let's try to minimize some error term, right? So I'm going to minimize the penalty, the difference between AX and B. Okay, so I've got some distance function, some cost function that says basically I'm going to penalize. And in this case, I've chosen in what directions, you know, I've, I've chosen the, the cost function, so it says what my values are in terms of what kind of deviations I like and what I don't like. Okay, but this is sort of a standard way to say, try to find me an x such that ax is approximately equal to b. <clears throat> if, the, if the error goes to zero, then I've solved the problem, and you know, I would expect that to be true when j has these properties. Okay? But this problem makes sense even when j can't get you to, there's, when, the, when a is such that I can't get, drive this error directly to zero. So you see how that's kind of a more robust specification of the problem. So this is um, where I give a, you know, just, I'll, I'm going to start using some of the language of optimization, but it'll be, I think, a gentle introduction to that. Let's even do it in the scalar case, right? So, um, and think about what are the, what does the geometry of that problem look like, right? So if I said, like that, right? No vector norms, nothing. This is just a squared of a scalar, okay? A is a scalar, B is a scalar of the data. I'm trying to find the smallest x. I think the geometry of that problem is easy to think about, right? This is, looks like a quadratic form, right? This is my ax minus b squared. This is x. And somewhere, there's a happy place where I'm at the minimum of that, right? And I'll call this the solution x star. And for this particular problem, uh, we can find x star very easily by just taking the gradient of that function, asking when the gradient is equal to 0. And that's going to tell us, since I know that in the case where um, you know, this curve is pointed up, it's a positive definite function, right? It's a convex function. Then the minimum is uh, going to give me the solution, the place where the gradient equals 0. OK, so if I take the gradient with respect to x of ax minus b squared, set it equal to 0. And this tells me that the solution to that just worked out is just b over a. So does that always have a solution? I'm just sorry, asking this sort of a almost trivial question, I guess, but right? A better not be zero, right? So what happens when a is very small? That's kind of what's happening as we get close to our singularity, right? When a is very small, this thing starts getting more and more elongated. This cost function, as I get small, it goes like this, and then maybe it goes like this, right? And it's, it's going to move out, and the optimal solution is going to move out this way. That's the geometry of what's happening here is that my cost function, as I change a and make a very small, it's going to move the cost function, the solution more and more towards infinity. Right? Just, that's just saying a, when a gets close to 0, x star is going to go to infinity. And the, the objective function follows suit. 
as it should. Okay, so um, that's bad, right? You don't want X star to go to infinity, and that's exactly what happens, that's what's in danger of happening when the Jacobian uh, goes to, loses rank. Okay, so the matrix form of that, are there questions about that? The matrix form requires <clears throat> more linear algebra, of course, but is really exactly the same math, okay? If I want to say minimize over x, now ax minus b, I can multiply this out if I wanted to. This is going to give me an A transpose AX plus, if I multiply it out, I guess it's minus 2 B transpose AX plus B squared. It's just another quadratic equation, right? And in two dimensions, if I had X1 and X2, it's still gonna just look like a quadratic function, right? And it's gonna have some optimum at the bottom. Right, everything holds in the matrix case. I can do the same thing. I can take the gradient of that function with respect to x. Now I do a little bit of of gradient math. And I set that equal to zero. And I find out that the gen slight generalization of what I did there is just B transpose A And guess what? This thing here is one of the pseudo is what you get when you call the pseudo inverse, right? There's a left and a right pseudo inverse, but this is the one we're using today. Okay, I could could write this as B transpose. It's the, it's the transpose of the pseudo inverse. I got a transpose here somewhere, but. Okay, so actually the pseudo inverse, which I said was just a generalization of the inverse, that's how I introduced it before, maybe how you've seen it before, it actually is doing something very clever, right? It's taking this slightly richer specification of the problem, and it's not necessarily guaranteeing that it's gonna get a cost of zero, but it's gonna give you the best cost it can. That's why the pseudo inverse will always give you something back Okay, and that something is exactly, you know, this. So that's the picture I want you to have in your head. The shape of that bowl, by the way, is just, you know, it's governed by A transpose A, right? The eigenvectors and eigenvalues of that matrix will change the shape of that bowl. I know that's you know, a lot of equations or whatever, but I want, you, I want you to have the intuition, right? So what happens when J starts to lose rank? Think about what happened here. The same thing happens in the vector case. This bowl starts getting flatter, maybe in one axis, maybe in multiple axes, but if it's, you know, as, as if, if it's one eigenvalue goes to zero, it will get very elongated to the point where it can be a trough if the eigenvalue is exactly zero. And the worst thing is that the minimum of that trough is gonna move off to infinity. Okay, so that's what happens 
That's what goes wrong when you call pseudo-inverse. It's not that it's, it's solving a beautiful problem for you. It's just that you're asking, the wrong, you're asking it to do the wrong thing. You're not telling it to be reasonable. You're just telling it to get as close as possible. Questions about that? Now, here's the, here's the win, OK? The, um, the language of optimization is way richer than just calling pseudo inverses, right? I can, this is an objective, but I could also add constraints. So what I'm going to do, for instance, is say, you know, get as close as possible, but don't pick a velocity greater than like 10. You know, I don't want my robot moving. It's got, because the controllers are going to set a velocity limit, right? So a perfectly good question, which looks simple in this case, is what if I did, you know, minimum of x ax minus b squared, but I'm going to do subject to, OK? Let's say I want x to be less than or equal to 2, something like that, OK? Then the picture is still like what I've got here, but maybe I've got 2 here. So it's going to say, go down as far as possible, but don't cross this line. If you get there, then I want the best solution to be right on the rail. OK? That's another way to write a mathematical program. And since we're going to be doing it a lot, let me just stop and say, in this language, this is the decision variables. This is the cost or objective. And these are constraints. I can do exactly the same thing in this problem. I could say I'd like the vector 2 to be less than norm 2 or something like this. Or I could say the ith element of the vector. Maybe every velocity, every joint velocity has a limit. So I can put a, I could put, let's say, x 0 less than 2, maybe x1 less than 3. I've got a different motor on that second joint, so I could use a different joint velocity limit. <clears throat> the language of optimization is super general, but we're playing in a very nice version of the optimization landscape where um, you know, this objective we wrote down this is a quadratic objective and it's a positive quadratic objective it can never be negative, right? Really the Generalization is that it's positive definite, or positive, at least semi-definite, but let's just say positive definite. Meaning the matrix, which gets inside here, this A transpose A, until it go, I should say semi-definite, because we're talking about when it can drop rank. So I'll say semi-definite here. Because the matrix A transpose A, the eigenvalues of this are all greater than or equal to zero. So my function is always going up, and it's always quadratic. It's, so it's a convex function, and it has a unique minimum. And if I restrict myself to any constraints that are of the form of linear equations, the absolute value can be written as just two linear equations. I could have written that as x less than 2 and x greater than negative 2. So these are linear constraints.
This is the domain of quadratic programming. You'll hear people talk about QPs. So now, when I run my controller, instead of calling pseudo inverse every time I want to hit every, you know, every time step, I want to decide what positions to send to the controller, I'll solve a small quadratic program. The geometry of it, I made it look deceptively simple in 1D. It's simple. It is simple in 1D, but um, in higher dimensions. You know, you have a quadrant. It still can only do that, roughly. But the geometry of these constraints can be interesting, and you want to solve it efficiently. So there are strong solvers, that, you know, strong numerical codes that will take the specification of the problem in this kind of language. They're called QP solvers, for instance. And they'll solve this problem for even very large matrices very fast. And it's, in, it's entirely practical to run them in a control loop. OK. Now, this, I tried to visualize the geometry of this, OK? I made a nice little animation here. That writes a small mathematical program that just I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about that in a minute, maybe more next time, but <clears throat> Okay, and here's what it looks like. This is my two link KUKA. Okay, so I basically I took the KUKA and I just froze all the two links because I can only plot 2D stuff. You know, I, I, if I have two decision for two velocities to, to move and I'm just trying to move in the plane or whatever, I can plot that. If you get higher dimensional, I can't plot it. Now, this green is the quadratic form in those two planes. That's just the objective. And the red is the constraints. Don't go outside those constraints. As you move through the singularity, let's see if I can make that visible enough, what happens? That quadratic form flattens out. And the solution is trying to move off to infinity. That's the bad case. But the QP says don't go past the limits. Yeah. So now I can just play with it a little bit, okay? So as I go close to the singularity, you can see that that becomes a trough instead of a bowl. It's actually, you know, until it's exactly zero, it's still got a, a minimum at some point, it's just off at infinity. And when it's exactly zero, it's infinity, yeah? But the QP can move right through there uh, pretty well. It'll always come back with a solution for you. Okay, so the quadratic program is a nice generalization of the pseudo inverse controller. Okay, um, I did have another notebook that just showed it actually moving the end effector, but just for the sake of time, trust me, it moves the end effector, yeah? If I, if I just command a velocity like this, it goes, okay, it works. And you can run it. So there's a language, um, uh, so, so Drake sort of has three big components. Um, you've seen the plant, multi-body plant. You've seen a bit of the diagrams, right, and context and all the stuff you love. Um, and then there's the third, sort of big piece of, of, of Drake is the mathematical program interface because I believe that the language that you want to talk to your, your multi-body plant is the language of optimization. And so 
you could find these pieces in different toolboxes, but having them in the one toolbox, I can easily say, make me a cost or constraint based on that robot. And I can do things that I wouldn't be able to do if they were separate. Okay, so the, the code looks pretty, pretty simple. You say like, make a new mathematical program. I will have two decision variables. I'm gonna add a constraint, like this is x0 plus x1 equals one, that's a linear constraint. x0 less than x1, that's also a linear constraint. I can write them both in the form of, of that. I can add a cost like x squared plus, x0 squared plus x1 squared solve, okay? And behind the scenes, what it does is it examines the costs and constraints that you've given it and tries to call the best solver. It has a bunch of commercial solvers that are back behind it. If you're at MIT, most of those commercial solvers are free with an academic license. Uh, if you're not a, in education, they're really expensive. <laughs> it's kind of like, you know, you learn how to use them and then you go off in industry and it's like, oh my gosh, that does cost a lot of money. Um, <clears throat> okay, but that's the language that we use. And, um, I guess I have just one minute. The code is pretty unintimidating, I think, but our a simple pseudo inverse controller. Oh, I forgot to close the other one. You can write a little pseudo inverse controller and then you can write a QP controller. They're, they're, the one that just uses the pseudo inverse can still move through, I just said a desired velocity, it just moves through. And then the differential IK solved as a quadratic program can do all that, but it can be robust to singularities and the like. Okay, there's a bunch of other things that you can do once you have this language of um, pseudo inverse, or of, of Jacobian control as a mathematical program. I'll list them, and the, the, the details are in the notes, but it's sort of nice to think about it. So <clears throat> the linear constraints we talked about here were just velocity constraints, right? The decision variables in my, my pseudo inverse-like controller, my Jacobian controller, were the velocities, and I had the, pro the objective was based on the Jacobian. But you can actually add some amount of position constraints. If you take a, if you take a, a linear interpolation of your Jacobian and try to say, what's my next position going to be? And you want them to not go past some linearization of a collision constraint. You can do that, actually. And similarly, you can take a derivative, a first derivative, and put acceleration constraints. So this becomes a super useful um, sort of language to, to start adding richer and richer specifications of what you want the, the controller to do, always locally, always locally, but saying, given I want to follow this, maybe I want to have, you know, don't want to run into a wall, and I don't want to exceed some accelerations, that can all fit in the language. And there's sort of right ways to write it so that you never, that it always has a solution. You know, you want to make sure you don't write constraints that can potentially not have a solution. Um, and that's an important thing, but, but mostly that's packaged up and you can just call the differential IK system and, and use that controller. You actually used it if you played with that first chapter notebook that half of you tried and the rest of you made me cry. And, um, but if you did, you might have gone to the limit and then in the IK solver said, you, you know, you've got no, you got no solution. That's because it was a simple form of the IK, but the full form actually is robust to that. Okay, good. See you Thursday. Yeah? Just um, when you were showing us the green thing. Yeah. Right. So the green thing is. You're saying it's the cost function, and the cost slash objective is the velocity. 